Okay, now we're going to look at biodiversity through Earth history. This is skipping ahead a couple chapters, but I think it makes more sense doing it this way right after biota. We'll be talking about how biology has changed over Earth history and how it's expressed in organisms. The fossil record is the only strong evidence that we have of biodiversity through time. Without fossil evidence, we would be pretty much clueless as to what life forms look like in the past. We could eventually figure it out now that we're more familiar with genetics. When we look at human evolution through history, by definition, evolution is the descent with modification through genetic mutation of pre-existing life forms. Now, we have made some dramatic changes in our appearance since the origin of our lineage. A few million years ago in our lineage, we lost our tail, we no longer needed it for balance to the degree we did before, we had a reduction in the length of our fingers because we weren't using them for grasping and climbing to the degree that we were previously, we began to develop a more upright pose and this resulted in many skeletal changes, not only in our spine, the position of our back, but the position of our head and also our legs, the joints of our body, all adapted to this very different posture. We went from crawling and climbing to fully permanent bipedal stature. Everyone's favorite evolutionary example is the giraffe. And uh, this relates to natural selection. Natural selection is the unequal survival and reproduction of organisms owing to environmental pressures that result in the preservation of favorable characteristics. This is the most important component of evolution next to the mutations themselves. What does this mean? When looking at a giraffe, there was an advantage to reaching higher and higher into the understory and ultimately into the lower canopy, such that animals with slightly longer necks could reach higher and obtain food that was unavailable to the others. This gave them an advantage. The disadvantage is now they have to develop a very large heart and a cardiovascular system that could pump blood up this pretty exceptional vertical distance to maintain consciousness, you know, to feed their brain oxygen. So the heart had to change, digestive system had to change, neck had to change, the spine did not gain vertebra, it merely lengthened them. And to support this neck and this head at this height required big processes to develop on these vertebra for muscle attachment. So these huge muscles are required to keep this head in the upright position. The giraffe also developed a very long tongue that it uses for grasping at leaves and twigs and pulling them into its mouth. So it's more than just the, the height of the animal that is changing. It's every aspect of the animal. Even the coloration of its skin has changed, provided some protection from predators, generally when they're smaller, when they're susceptible. An example from humans that um, might not seem intuitive at first is the development of a genetic disorder called sickle cell anemia. When a person has this genetic disorder, a number of their red blood cells assume this sickle shape. They're also less flexible than normal shaped red blood cells and this causes a variety of problems. One of the biggest problems is these being inflexible and shaped like these sickles, they plug up blood vessels. And when they plug the blood vessels, they prevent blood from reaching organs. They prevent oxygen from reaching those organs. And this results in generally premature death. So why would people have sickle cell anemia? Why would this perpetuate itself through human history? About 10 to 40% of people in Sub-Sahara Africa have at least one sickle cell genetic pair in their genome. Well, it turns out if one of your strands of DNA from your mother or father has the sickle cell anomaly, this gives you an advantage against developing malaria. It's a bit of a weird story, but the basically the, the enzymes that are present when you have a single sickle cell anomaly in your genome produce carbon monoxide and uh, this prevents you from developing cerebral malaria. So if you have one defect, you're able to resist malaria. 
if you receive that defect from both parents, your mother and father, then you develop the disease sickle cell anemia. So it's a natural selection to have one of these defects. That's favorable. It's unfavorable when you have two. So this is kind of a, a genetic battle for evolution that isn't quite working out. This single mutation would never be preserved in the fossil record. So I'd consider this an evolutionary gamble. We can prevent malaria, but we run the risk of killing a fairly high percentage of patients. So we save them from one fatal disease by making them susceptible to another. That's not an entirely good gamble. Adaptations are characteristics that enhance an organism's survival and or reproductive success. These are a couple pictures of birds of paradise. There's a bunch of different species of these. These are males, and you might imagine that this isn't an adaptation for a good safe life in a jungle. The last thing you want to do is draw attention to yourself in the wild because predators are looking. However, if you're looking to attract a female, then looking pretty outrageous is one of the ways to, uh, to attract the mate. And reproductive success is key to perpetuating this look and perpetuating your own genetics. So they run the risk of being eaten in order to impress the females. And there's an evolutionary drive to get crazier and crazier all the time. Now, like sickle cell anemia, eh, they might push it too far in some cases, and it becomes a negative. Even though the females might be impressed, the males are consumed at a higher rate. The shinier, brighter males would be consumed at a higher rate, and that's an evolutionary disadvantage. This brings us to extinction, the loss of all individuals of a species. Here we have a couple examples of some species induced by humans. Here on the left, we have the dodo. This was a fairly large bird, a flightless bird, that was discovered by Portuguese sailors in 1507. And because it was large, flightless, and not afraid of any terrestrial predators, it was easy for the sailors to walk up and kill these birds in great numbers. The numbers were so great that they drove them to extinction after about 160 years or so. Perhaps a more extreme example is the disappearance of the passenger pigeon of North America. In the early 1800s or so, there was an estimate of about 3 to 5 billion of these birds in North America. The flocks were so great that they would actually darken the skies. They would break the branches off of trees, knock down parts of entire forests, surely with their numbers. Hunting for cheap food and for sport wiped the birds down from three to five billion to zero by 1914. The last female died in a zoo in Cincinnati at this time. This is an example uh, from the Galapagos Islands that are famous for both evolution and extinction. Named Lonesome George, he was discovered in 1971. He's the last male of this species of giant tortoise. Because the, the last of an individual species is known as an endling. Unfortunately, George passed away in 2012. Efforts to save the species were unsuccessful. Another example is from Tasmania. The Tasmanian tiger here, which is a thylacine, the genus and species name meaning dog-headed with a pouch. These are carnivorous marsupials. Essentially, you can think of them as kangaroos that have converged evolutionarily into a, a dog-like creature. In May 1930, a British farmer named Wolf Batty shot the last wild Tasmanian tiger as he caught it invading his hen house. This is a photo of Wilf with his uh, trophy here. A couple individuals lived on in the Hobart Zoo. Hobart's the capital of Tasmania. This is the last individual of the species named Benjamin, and even more tragically, died of exposure in 1936 after his zookeepers left him outside on a cold night. Another end to another species. Now, I can't find my photo of the uh, the rock art. I do have this photo here, which is a pretty bad photo, that indicates that the aboriginals of Australia were recording what they saw. 
And one of the things that they saw was the Tasmanian tiger, depicted here in rock art from Kakadu. I talked about this place before, I think in the last lecture, in uh, the Northern Territories of Australia. So they painted what they observed, and this is what they observed, something that can no longer be seen in the wild. So another uh, tragic example of humans showing up in a location and very quickly wiping out a species that has been around, in this case, for perhaps three million years. Images like this are fairly well known. This is cave art from Lescaux in France. This cave was discovered, I'm not kidding, by an 18-year-old Frenchman who lost his dog named Robot down a hole. He returned shortly afterwards with a couple of friends and they brought in a professional sketch artist who fortunately accurately sketched these images. And this is important because the cave was quickly destroyed by visitors. By 1963, the cave was shut down for public visits, and we now rely on these early sketches as some of the best representations of what the art looked like before we found it and ruined it. They depict species of animals that are still with us, extant species, and several extinct species. The more dramatic here in this image is an aura. They're kind of a giant wild cattle, uh, much more aggressive than cows today for the most part. And uh, that aggression was ultimately bred out of the animals by humans. Who wants a dangerous cow? Uh, I got a funny story about that, but I won't go do it now. So people write down, people draw, people photograph what they see. This is a bit of human nature that goes back, as we can see here, approximately 17,000 years. But this stuff is very difficult to date. We find evidence for it going back around a half a million years in some locations. This was a freshwater clam that was etched by an extinct species of human, Homo erectus, 500,000 years ago. It was a zigzag carved with a sharp object. When we talk about biodiversity through Earth history, we need to consider the rate of change in the number of species on Earth. Now, the rate of change in the number of species on Earth is equal to the origination rate, or speciation rate, minus the extinction rate or the disappearance rate. Now, this is a pretty fluffy number. It doesn't really mean much of anything, uh, as far as I'm concerned. It's estimated that 10 to 25 species evolve each year, and about the same number become extinct each year. Now, this depends on what you consider a new species or what you consider the extinction of that species. And there are ongoing arguments, maybe forever, about that. It is clear, though, from the fossil record that some periods of geologic time had far greater rates of extinction and far greater rates of evolution. We can discuss this in a couple different ways. Logistic growth is such that population increases most rapidly when numbers are low, and the birth rate decreases and or death rate increases due to competition for food and space, diseases that interrupt the life cycle. Eventually, the birth rate is going to equal the death rate at the carrying capacity. So here we see a population with unlimited resources and unlimited reproductive capabilities. They're going to reproduce exponentially, as we discussed just recently. This exponential growth is going to continue until the birth rate decreases, death rate increases, they run out of food and space, or a disease strikes. And in the examples we just saw, humans strike and wipe out a species. So we reach the carrying capacity. We're getting close to reaching the carrying capacity for humans on Earth. That's another story. A species, again, 
is defined as all closely related organisms that can potentially interbreed and produce fertile offspring. We can't observe animals breeding in the past, so paleontologists use similarity in morphology to define species, a similarity in the shape, the morph of organisms. Here we see a variety of brachiopod species, and they're going to be defined by the differences in shape of their shells. These aren't clams. They're not even closely related to clams. They're not really closely related to clams. Uh, very different organisms. They look similar, but they're very different. Keeping track of these species and keeping them organized was something that's been around since Plato and Aristotle. Carolinus Linnaeus came along in 1735 and published this thesis on nature. This is when he introduced the binomial nomenclature that we use for identifying animals by genus and species. Here we have a depiction of taxonomy. This is the systematic organization of living or fossil organisms into a hierarchy. So we're going to start out with a common ancestor and evolve into a number of different genera and species. So here are the ones we're going to be most familiar with. They're going to be domestic cat, domestic dog, and the wolf. Now, domestic dogs were bred. They plastically evolved from being wolves. Let's take a closer look at one of these lineages here. We'll take a look at the, the Canidae. And as an example, we have the red fox, a common species of canid in Canada. This photo was taken last year in Cranberry Portage, Manitoba. This was the same time those two crazy guys were running around, the killers from Port Alberni on Vancouver Island. We're running loose up near Gillum, so they had driven right past us here. So we're going to take a look at the uh, scientific classification of this fancy looking critter. We're going to start with the domain, the base of all cellular life forms, Eukarya. Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Chordata, Class Mammalia, Order Carnivora, Family Canidae, genus Vulpes, and the species Vulpes. So this is what we use to identify a red fox and its relationship to other organisms, principally other mammals. Now, one way to remember this, this is important to remember, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. King Philip came over from Great Spain, or King Philip came over from groovy Spain, if you're an Austin Powers fan. When we look at our evolutionary development, we see that it strongly follows embryonic development. So here we have a group of organisms, distantly related organisms, include fish, salamanders, tortoises, chicks, hogs, calves, rabbits, and humans. So fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, hogs, calves, rabbits, and humans. Now, when we start out in life, we all look very similar. In fact, at this stage, we all have these things in common. We have a notochord, which in humans has largely been converted into our spinal cord and uh, spine. Some animals still exhibit these as adults. Animals like lamprey and sturgeon, for instance. We see sturgeon in the South Saskatchewan River. All of these also display a post-anal tail. We have a tail. We have remnants. Most of us have remnants of a tail, uh, even as adults, and paired branchial grooves. We can see these here. These grooves eventually are going to form a jawbone here, the mandibular arch. Then we have a series of other arches, which in other organisms form the gill structures, gill arches that form the base, the structural base for gills. Now, gills have gone away in humans. They've, we've evolved away from them, um, but we do still exhibit those features at this stage in our life. As we progress in embryonic development, we gradually become more and more human-like. Well, we still look pretty similar to cows and rabbits, even later on. When we look at the fossil record, we run into some problems. And um, one of the problems is that land animals and land plants as well, are fairly rare in the fossil record. 
This means we can't really use them in a definitive way to determine the biodiversity at any given time. We barely understand the biodiversity today on Earth, let alone going back millions to hundreds of millions of years. In part for this reason, mostly for this reason, we generally use the record of marine invertebrates. These are common, mostly shallow water animals. They've been around for 500 million years, and they're generally well-preserved. It's much easier to fossilize a hard object than soft tissue. So things like calcium carbonate skeletons tend to be fairly well-preserved. So when we look at apparent species diversity here in figure A, we can see that most of the species, the period with the most abundant species is the tertiary. As we go back in time, species become more and more rare. Now, this isn't to say we have more species today than we ever have in the past. It's a problem with the fossil and rock record. Part of the record problem has to do with geologic map area. This is if we were to look at a geologic map of the world, we would see that most of the exposed sedimentary rock is going to be tertiary in age. Because it's the most recent, it's on top of the older stuff. That makes sense. Going back in time, that holds together pretty well except for a few oddities. The Triassic, the Permian, the Devonian, and the Silurian show apparently greater map area than periods before and after. The same goes for the volume of sediment that's generated at any given time. The volume of sediment that's present on Earth today indicates that the tertiary again comes out as a winner. Again, it's youngest, it's on top, that's to be expected. But we have some periods going back, such as the Devonian, which show exceptionally large amounts of sediment generated during that period of time. This implies some kind of mountain building event. In other words, we crashed some things together, we deformed them, we uplifted them, and then we weather them. When we weather this material, we produce sediment. And therefore, when there's lots of sediment, there must have been something to weather. So when you take a look at the land area of different age rocks combined with the volume of different age rocks, then you get a better picture of what really existed at any given time. So at first glance, it looks as though species numbers have increased exponentially through geologic time. This isn't true because of the difference in the amount of sediment that's apparent at the Earth's surface and the amount of sediment that was ultimately generated at the time that the fossils would have been created. A couple things really stand out when we look at the fossil record. The first one is the Cambrian explosion. This is considered the most remarkable burst of evolution. During this Cambrian explosion, all phyla present on the Earth today, as well as many classes and orders, evolve. After 100 million years, the diversity levels off, and we run into a series of mass extinctions. A mass extinction is when 25% or more of extant families disappear. These mass extinctions occur at the end of the Ordovician, about 440 million years ago, during the Devonian, 360 million years ago, the end of the Permian, about 250 million years ago, the end of the Triassic, about 206 million years ago, and the famous one, the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, about 65 million years ago. When we look at the number of orders, we see that higher taxa have greater resiliency. The number of orders tends to remain relatively invariant once we get into the Silurian. The number of families remains a bit more sensitive. We see that as many as 50% of families were lost at the Permo-Triassic extinction. We lost 15% of orders, 50% of families, and about 85% of genera. The estimate for species is around 95%, but whatever. We don't know how many species were present, making it difficult to know how many species were no longer present afterwards. Needless to say, this is the big one. When most of life on Earth became extinct at the Permo-Triassic boundary. And there's some new ideas as to what caused that that we'll go over in a bit. 